Hey, welcome to Woodwork for Humans, the series where we build great things out of wood using super basic, inexpensive tools. And a couple of weeks ago, we built this tool tote, and I'm really happy with the way it came out. It looks good, and it solves my tool storage problem. And during the building, we used this contractor's speed square to measure and mark things. And you know, it's okay, it got the job done, but it's got one big limitation, which is that you can't check your components for square because there's no inside square measurement. And that's a big limitation. What you really need for checking your components is a tri-square. And these are really perfect because you can use the outside to measure things and you can also use the inside to see if your components are square and true. And the good news about tri-squares is that they're very inexpensive and very easy to use. The bad news is that whether you get a vintage one or a new one, they're often going to be out of square. And that can be difficult to correct in a home shop with minimal tools. But you can make your own tri-squares just out of wood. They can be perfectly accurate and usable, and you can true them up really easily if they ever go out of square. Also, building your own tri-squares out of wood is a great way to build your woodworking skills. So you might as well give it a try. So you might as well try it out. Uh, God, I just can't make that joke work. It's, it's too awful. Sorry. So to build our squares, we're just going to use all the regular Woodwork for Humans tools that we've been using up to now. There's a list of everything down in the description. But for this project, because we're going to be doing more precise marking and measuring, we're going to want to ditch the pencil and switch over to a marking knife. Uh, knife lines are more precise, and because you're actually making a cut into the wood, they can help to guide other tools. It's really the preferred way to do your layout for woodworking. I recommend you grab this very inexpensive Stanley folding knife knife. Uh, you can get these off of Amazon for $5 and they work really great. If you're just getting into woodworking, you will hear some people say that you absolutely have to have a fancy single bevel purpose-made marking knife and that's just incorrect. This is what I use every day. I'm perfectly happy with it and it's cheap. Link in description. So we'll start with our super easy square because it's easier. And in order to make this really easy, what we're going to do is use pre-dimensioned lumber. I grabbed this down at the big box store. They call it a craft board. It is a good sized piece of hardwood, in this case poplar, and uh, it was $4.60. And what I like about this stuff is that it's straight and square and flat, and it's only a quarter of an inch thick, which is really perfect for our needs. So grabbing something like this eliminates a lot of tedious stock preparation, and it allows things to be easier for the beginner. If you don't have a big box store near you or a source for good lumber like this, keep your eye out for people getting rid of old pieces of furniture, um, especially like dressers and anything with doors or drawers on it. If you can use the sides or panels from doors, or if you can use the sides and bottoms out of old drawers, like an old desk drawer or something, those are very frequently made out of thin, stable, dry, good quality hardwood, and they'll definitely give you enough parts to make all the squares you could need. To make our super easy tri-square, we're just going to cut four components and laminate them together, and then we'll just have a square. Now, three out of these four components are the same width, so I'm going to lay out one long rip on my board. And I'll do that by just marking out the dimensions with my tape measure, connecting the marks together with a piece of scrap, and then ripping down that line. Now, this project has enough measurements and details that I thought it'd be a good idea if I came up with a set of plans. I have them available on my website. They are very inexpensive, and you can click the link down in the description to check those out. While I'm doing this saw rip, I'm going to keep it outside of my line, and you want to do it very carefully. If you're sloppy with your technique like I was, you might split into your waist. This isn't a big deal, but you don't want to waste any material that you don't have to. Once I've ripped it to my approximate width, I'm going to plane it down till I'm right on top of my pencil line, and then when when I have the piece done, I'm going to want to check and see if it's square or not. But I don't have a tri-square because that's what I'm making. Well, what we can do is take our speed square and turn it into a quick tri-square by just taking a flat piece of stock and super gluing it to the flattest part of the square. Then you've got a completely reasonable little square checker right here, and I can put that up to my stock and give it a look, and oh! Turns out my stock is actually not as square as I would like it to be. It's a little bit low on this side. So I'll get my plane and I'll true that up before I move on to the next step. 
To finish making the stock of my square, I just need to cross cut my three components. So I'll lay out those cuts, and then when I actually go to make them, I'll clamp a piece of stock along my layout lines. This Japanese saw that I'm using is very flexible, and so it'll follow a guide if you let it. This is kind of like doing a flush cut, so I just hold it up against the piece of stock and slowly execute the cut, and I get a really straight square cross cut with minimal cleanup that I have to do afterwards. Now, I'm going to clamp all these pieces together to make the stock of my square, um, and then I'm clamping up three components at the same time with glue in between them, and that glue is going to like lubricate things and turn the whole thing into a slippery mess, but there's a really easy fix for that. You just use a little bit of table salt. Take a couple of grains, really just a couple, and sprinkle them on the glue in between each component. Salt crystals are square, and they've got sharp corners, and so they will bite into the wood and keep the wood from sliding around. But salt is, of course, water-soluble, and wood glue is made from water, so the salt will just dissolve into the glue and disappear, and you'll never see it afterwards. So once I've got all these pieces together with glue and a tiny bit of salt, I line them up, and then I put another piece of scrap on top of them. This is called a cawl, C-A-U-L. It's a really common thing woodworkers do to spread out the force of a clamp. Once I've got it clamped down to my tabletop, I'm going to leave it overnight, because that's going to give me maximum strength. While I'm waiting for it to dry, I will rip and cross-cut the last piece, which is going to be the beam of this square, and then cut out this little notch detail. That might not make a ton of sense now, but it will during assembly, and I'll explain all that later. Now I've pretty much got all these parts as done as they can get, but I've got to wait for the glue to dry, so I'm going to start making my slightly more complicated square while I'm waiting for these pieces to come out of the clamps. So when you go to make your second square, it's really convenient if you can make it out of scraps that are already sort of at the right dimensions. So I found a piece of maple and a piece of walnut that were already close to the thickness that I wanted. I cross-cut them and cleaned them up real quick with a plane, and here they are. This piece, which is going to be my rule, is about one-third the thickness of this piece, which is going to be my stock. And as far as lengths go, it's about a three to two ratio. So my rule piece is about 10 inches long, and my piece for the stock is a little under seven inches long. You can play with these proportions any way you want. Make the square to fit the way you work. Now, I've also decided to deliberately make this square pretty small, because the other square I'm making is fairly large, and I don't need two big squares. I'm using some really hard, dense woods for this one, because I expect this square to get the most use, and I want it to hold up to the most abuse around the shop. In order to make this square, all we're going to have to do is fit our beam into our stock, and we'll pretty much be done. But, because of the magic of filmmaking, the glue is already dry on our other pieces. So, let's pull those out of the clamps, Plane off any unevenness or glue marks. Do a quick finish planing on the blade, and while we're doing that, make sure to stay away from the area that's going to be in the joint. If you plane this a lot thinner, it's not going to fit. And then the two finished pieces should look something like this, and they should fit together more or less like this. And this is what your square is going to look like. Now, what we have to do is put it together and test it. Hold on. Okay, so, not even close. It's not even close to being square. But that's exactly what I expected, because we've only sort of rough prepared the components so far. Let's talk about the beam a little bit. I added this little notch here for a couple of reasons. One of them is that it's going to make this very simple joint. This is called a bridle joint right here. Uh, this joint, not super strong the way it is. Adding this little notch, when it's assembled, is going to allow some force to rest against the stock, and as force is applied down to the rule, it's going to make this joint much, much more stable and much less likely to pull out of true. But the other advantage to having this little notch is I have this shelf here, and I can adjust the squareness of my square just by fiddling with this notch. Now, right now, my square is out of true this way. The blade is much too high. And that's really obvious to see when I look at my notch. My notch is too high right there. So I'm going to clamp this in the notch of my bench, and then very carefully pair across this ledge. Then I'll reassemble the joint, check again, pair, check, repeat, repeat as necessary until the whole thing fits together as square as possible. Then, for gluing the whole thing together, I'm actually going to assemble it around my speed square, which I've tested before and I know is pretty accurate. And by using this as a clamping guide, I'm going to have the best chance of getting a really clean square when all is said and done. Once that's all set up in the clamps, I'll leave it to dry and turn my attention back to the other square. 
To move on with our second square, we're going to need to take our stock and get our beam into it somehow. And to do that, we're going to cut a kind of a U-shaped joint right in the end of this. And that's going to allow our other piece just to slot inside of it. And this is called a bridle joint, where one piece just slides into the other this way. And you don't see this joint used a ton because it's not super strong, but it's an old and traditional joint and it's more than good enough for what we're doing. Now, with any joinery, you're not going to get a good result unless you start with good layout. For a project like this, it would be very handy to have a fancy marking gauge or a really nice accurate square like this. Of course, if we owned a square like this, we wouldn't be making our own squares. So we'll need a little workaround. To lay out my bridle joint, I'll get a little scrap of material, like this piece of plywood right here. And it's the same thickness as my beam, or maybe a little bit thinner. Doesn't make a huge difference. I will lay my stock down on my bench and lay my little spacer next to it, and then use my marking knife to trace a line right on top of that piece of scrap. And when you're doing this, it's much better to make three or four light passes with the knife instead of one heavy pass. You're much more likely to be accurate. Once I've walked that line all the way around my piece of stock, then I'll take my spacer and add the actual beam of my square on top of that, and then trace that line all the way around the piece too. And then I'm going to have two nice parallel lines clearly laid out in my piece of stock. Now they don't have to be perfectly centered in your stock. They can be off a little bit to one side or another. The point is that the lines have to be really parallel and square. If you get that, you'll get a good result. Now, we're going to cut this joint out with our Ryoba saw, which is a flexible saw, not necessarily ideal for joinery. I know a lot of people do joinery with these, but I don't usually, and I'm still getting used to it. So I'm going to make things easier by myself by creating a knife wall. I just take one of my wide chisels, set it inside my layout lines, just a tiny bit, and then slowly work my way in to my layout line. And what I'm doing is just carving out a tiny little chip of material all around the line that I've made. And that's going to give me a nice little V-shaped notch that my saw can just fall into and be guided through the cut. It's really helpful for making a joint like this. Once I've got my knife wall all around, I set my piece up in the bench and slowly start ripping with my real saw. It goes okay, not fantastic. Um, this side right here came out decently, but you can see that the other side, it wandered quite a bit. It's really bad in the back where I actually had to restart my cut and do it again. But all the stuff that I messed up here is on the waist side, so I still think I can salvage this. And now the only problem that I have is, how do I get the waist out of the middle of my bridle joint? Well, for that, I'm going to take my narrowest chisel. I'll clamp my stock down flat to my bench and then start working that waist out. I'll go very, very close to my baseline and tap the chisel straight down. Then I'll go in at an angle and tap in towards the line I just made. And I'll repeat that, going straight down and then in at an angle, taking out more and more of the waste and taking bigger bites as I go. Now I'm going to stay away from my very bottom baseline here because I'll want to trim that later. And I'll try to take small bites because if I get too greedy, I'm going to snap the whole thing and have to start over again. Once I've got the main piece of waste out, I'm going to have some cleanup to do because my saw curves aren't great. I'll take a wide, flat chisel and very gently pair the inside walls of my bridle joint and start test fitting my beam. When the two of them fit together really well, it'll be time for glue up. So a little bit of chiseling and I took a joint that was, you know, kind of mediocre and made it pretty good. The beam fits nicely and this is a nice, even looking bridle joint right here. But it's still, I don't know, it's okay. So you know what? I just did it again. I cut this one using a similar technique, except instead of making the knife wall this time, I actually cut a saw kerf all the way around the area I was going to cut, and then followed through with the ripping edge of the Riova saw. This is a technique that some of my viewers turned me on to, and it works really well. So thanks for your advice, guys. I'm really taking the time to adapt to these Japanese-style saws. They're very different than the Western back saws that I'm used to. But this whole thing just goes to show you that when you're doing a little project, like making your own tools, if something doesn't go right, just do it again. You're using scrap wood anyway. I'm going to glue these smaller squares up using the same techniques that I used for the bigger square. The only difference here is that I'm going to glue them up using 5 minute epoxy mixed with a little bit of walnut sawdust. That's going to fill in any tiny gaps that I might have around my joint and give me a really polished final look. While the glue on these is drying, I'm going to do some trimming and detail work on the larger square. And then I'd like all of these squares to have a couple of pins through the bridle joint for extra stability. For my big poplar square, I'm just going to use some bamboo chopsticks because bamboo is a really dimensionally stable and ultra strong material and I got it for free from the Korean barbecue place down the street. 
For the more fancy squares, I'm actually going to go with some brass rod. If you've never worked with brass before, it is super easy to cut. All you need is a cheap hacksaw and then maybe a file or some sandpaper to smooth things out. And it only takes me a few minutes to get all of these squares pinned and looking sharp. So now, all three of my squares are finished. And I'm really happy with the way they look. They're really pretty. But pretty's not going to get the job done. This is a marking and measuring tool, and it needs to be accurate. So I've got to test it. Here's how we do that. I start with a piece of melamine. This is just a shelf that a neighbor of mine was throwing away. But melamine's a great material because it's very flat and straight, and it doesn't go out of true even when the humidity gets weird. So you can grab a sheet of any similar material with a flat surface and a true edge. And sometimes it's good to put some paper on it. I'm just using some printer paper here. Put your square against it, let the stock register against the edge, and then draw a line on one side of the blade. Then flip the whole thing 180 degrees and draw a line on the same side of the blade. And get the lines either right next to each other or right on top of each other. And ideally, what you're looking for is either one line, because your two lines have hit exactly and they're right in the same place, or two lines that are very close together and are perfectly parallel the whole way up. If you've got that, your square is true. And you're going to want to do that on the inside of the blade and the outside of the blade, because just having one doesn't give you any guarantees. And the good news is that both of my smaller squares are already dead on. I guess clamping them up against that speed square was all I needed to do. I can set these aside. The bad news is that my big square is out. Not by a ton, it's not terrible, but enough that I need to do something about it if this is going to be a decent marking tool. I can tell just by looking at the lines that I've got a little more material in here towards the corner and a little less out here. So what I'm going to do is just use whatever tools seem appropriate just to trim a little bit in here and then sort of blend everything together. So I could plane, I could chisel, I could even use sandpaper on a block or a file. All of those things would work just to take off that tiny bit of material. And I'm going to be really careful and cautious as I'm going. Test it, do a little work, test it, do a little more work, make sure that it's just perfect. When I've got these all the way done, I'm going to finish them with some shellac. It's one of my favorite finishes for stuff like this because it's easy and durable and it dries really, really quickly. And once my squares are all trued up and sanded and finished, well, they honestly look wonderful. I mean, this is more than I was expecting when I started the project. I was just going for measuring tools. And as time went on, I thought, well, I'll use a slightly fancier wood. Oh, I've got some brass. I'll put pins in here. And I ended up with these. <laughs> it's, it's a nice feeling. I made these, and I did them totally by hand. And I really think my viewers can do them, too. And this is a special project for me because I just got invited to be a guest blogger on the excellent blog, Toolerable. I know, it's a funny name. I <laughs> I actually really like it. Uh, so I'm going to be doing an article. It is already out right now. You can click down in the link and you can get some process shots and some additional details of how I did the work. And you should also check out the rest of the Toolerable blog because it's excellent, especially for hand tool woodworking and for beginners. And just like all of my videos, this one's got a free tip sheet that you can also download and check out. And it's got extra information and measurements. And because this project has a lot of measurements, I also have plans. They are extremely inexpensive, you can get those at rexkruger.com slash store, or you can click the link. Now, the people who don't have to buy those plans are my patrons, because my patrons got these plans and my last set of plans for free. If you're interested in getting free stuff and seeing my videos on Saturdays instead of Wednesdays, go over to patreon.com slash rexkruger and see if you want to throw a couple bucks in the hat. My patrons are the people who make these videos possible, and I appreciate them more than I can say. Of course, I also appreciate my viewers, especially my international viewers. In my last video, I asked you guys to tell me what countries you're from, and I've got some flags, and I'm going to put some flags up back here. But the response to that video was overwhelming. That video's only been up for two days as I'm sitting here recording this, and I already have over 500 comments. And I'm trying to get this video out, so I don't have time to sort through that right this second. But I'm going to get there. I'm probably going to get there this week. And if you want to see the progress on the flag sign, go ahead and follow me on Instagram, at Rex Kruger. You can see how the flag thing is coming along and all the rest of my projects, including a lot of stuff that I don't make videos about, like client builds and things for the shop and gifts I make for my friends and blacksmithing. If I mention I'm a blacksmith, I am. It's awesome. You should look at my Instagram and see me do blacksmithing. And anyway, I just super appreciate my viewers, so thanks a bunch for watching.